I'm going to talk about Gauss's Law. Um, I'll be honest. There's a lot of, of textbooks that get into Gauss's Law way too early. And, and they kind of use it just some magic trick to solve for electric field. And it's more than that. It's way more than that. But I still want to show you the magic trick because of magic. So let me talk about flux in general because Gauss's Law deals with flux. And we don't just have to have electric flux. We can have flux for anything. So I have here a coaster. And it's a it's just a small square that I want to use for my example. And imagine that it's out. I'm standing like this in the rain. And it's raining. And the question is what? how much rain hits this this surface and I want to I want to see what can change the amount of rain that hits the surface so what things could I change that would make it rain more on this well number one I can make it rain harder right if it's raining faster and harder then rain, more rain is going to hit this number two I could change the air the 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 angle right if I change rotate it like this then as the rain comes down it's going to be hitting perpendicular if I turn it like this the rain's going to miss it so in between, you know, only about half is going to get it. It's, it's like looking at it, it looks smaller as I turn it. And then finally, imagine that I could make the area bigger. If I make the area bigger, I could increase the rain. So that would be rain flux. Rain flux tells you how much rain hits this surface. And so electric flux is the same thing. It's how much electric field crosses through a surface. It depends on the, the value of the electric field. It depends on the size of the area. And it depends on the orientation. Um, now, it, let's get into Gauss's Law. So let's just get right to it. I'm going to skip over here. I'm going to turn off my little camera thing. Laptop cam off. Okay. So let's think about a point charge. And really what I'm trying to do in this video, I'm going to get to this problem. And this problem is a sphere of radius R with a charge Q spread all over it. And I want to find the electric field. And we're going to use Gauss's Law for that. So Gauss's law, imagine that I have this point charge right here, and I want to calculate the electric field. So if I find some point in space, I can calculate the electric field. It, I need to know the value of the charge Q. I need to know this vector from the charge to the observation location. And then I can use this equation. This says the electric field, the vector electric field, is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. That's just a constant. 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught equals 9 times 10 to the 9th newtons meter squared per coulomb squared. Q is the value of the charge divided by the magnitude of the distance from the charge to the observable location squared. And then R hat is a unit vector in the same direction because if electric field is a vector, then this has to be a vector. So that R hat makes it a vector. If I change the value of the sign, I get negative. But, but Gauss's law deals with the pattern of a field around an object. And if you see here, I left off an arrow, I think. If you notice that I've drawn the electric field in this region, and it's always pointing radially outward, and as it decreases, as you get further away, it decreases in strength. So imagine that I were able to construct an imaginary sphere. We call this a Gaussian surface. It's not really there. It's just a mathematical object then at every point on the sphere I have little pieces of the sphere and at every contact, every location the electric field is perpendicular to the area of the sphere so what happens is we get a very trivial way to calculate the, the electric the, the flux I guess I should write down the electric flux first so we define flux as uh, we use the symbol Phi um, I'm gonna give you the the real definition, and then we'll we'll talk about it. Uh, the real definition looks like this. It's a surface integral of the electric field dot n hat. Now n hat is a unit vector pointing perpendicular to the surface. So all over the place, n hat changes for this surface. So and this is the dot product. Uh, so I'll talk about that part later. And then dA is a small surface element. So this is a surface integral. So you have to integrate over the whole surface. And I think that's important to realize that this is the real form of the flux. And electric field, because it takes into account that electric field is a vector, and it gives you a single value. Now, let's say I have a finite piece. It's tilted. I've tilted it. So that's n hat. And then the electric field is like this, E. 
such that there is an angle theta between those two, the area, the normal vector to the area, and this has a size of a. Then for this one, the flux would be e magnitude times a magnitude times cosine of theta. So I did cosine theta, e dot n hat is going to e, be e cosine theta. So that's how I can calculate the flux for a single thing. Okay, let's find the flux. Uh, let me go ahead and state Gauss's law because what Gauss's law does is it allows you to use a trick, sort of, to find the values of the electric field. We already know what the electric field is around this thing. So let's go over here to this diagram. Let me redraw it and then we'll do uh, that. So here's my charge, Q. And then imagine I draw a Gaussian sphere. It has a radius of R. And if I assume an idea about the pattern of the field in space. If I assume the electric field looks like this, that it's radially outward, then I can say the flux is equal to that electric field, the magnitude, times the area of the Gaussian sphere, and then they're perpendicular, so cosine theta would be 1, and that's it. That's the, that is a closed area. If I have a closed area, then this would be equal to the total charge inside divided by epsilon naught. And that's what Gauss's law says. It says that the flux is equal to Qn over epsilon naught for a closed surface. And I'll show you some more examples of this later. Um, okay, so going back over here, if I have this, I have a sphere, I know the area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. So if I put that in up here, I get e times 4 pi r squared equals q inside, which is just q, divided by epsilon naught. And if I solve this for e, I get e equals 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught q over r squared. And this gives me the magnitude of the electric field, not the vector value. And in fact, I've already chosen the direction of the electric field in order to do this calculation. And that's why it's kind of a trick, right? You kind of have to know something in order to get something. And we, but we can use that in the next problem. Okay, so that's Gauss's law. It's kind of silly. Let's go back and do the sphere thing. I'll do the sphere, and then um, I'll, I'll tell you a, a story that's not really a story. Okay, so here's my sphere, radius r, and it has a total charge q, uh, and I want to find the electric field both inside and outside the sphere. So let's start right here. Let's start inside the sphere. I'm going to assume that the electric field is still radially outward. But notice here that my charge inside of my Gaussian sphere is not the total charge. It's not q. It's just some of the charge. And you may think, well, what the heck? Doesn't this charge outside of here do anything to that electric field? And it does. Um, it's just that the charges over here make an electric field that cancel the charges over here, so it's kind of like it's not even there. I know that's weird. I agree. It is indeed weird. So if I use uh, Gauss's law for this case, I can say E times A equals Qn over epsilon naught. Now let's put in our values. We don't know E. My area is going to be 4 pi r squared. Remember that this whole thing has a radius of r, capital R. We're just some variable r right there. And that's going to be qn over epsilon naught. Now we have to find qn. If I know, let's say that this has a charge density of rho. So that means the, char the total charge, q total, divided by the total volume. So that would be q over the volume of the sphere, the whole sphere, the whole sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. So that's rho. Now I can use that to find qn. That's going to be the volume of the sphere that I have right here, which is 4 thirds pi little r cubed, times the density, which is q over 4 thirds pi big r cubed. The 4 thirds cancel, and I get r cubed q over r cubed. And that's the charge inside. So let's put this all together. I get E equals, where did that go? E times equals, right? So, and I'm going to have to divide both sides by 4 pi r squared. I get Qn, which is this, r cubed Q over r cubed. And then I divide by 
4, and I have an epsilon naught, 4 pi epsilon naught r squared. So if I simplify that, this cancels. I get q r over 4 pi epsilon naught r r cubed. And that's the value of the, that's the magnitude electric field inside the sphere. So as I get further away from the center, then the electric field increases. At the center, r is equal to zero, so the electric field is zero. Okay, so that's E inside. What about E outside? What about over here? Now I have the same idea. I can say E equals, or well, E times A, it's going to be uh, e times 4 pi r squared. That's the surface area of that sphere. And that's going to be equal to qn, which is just q over epsilon naught. Because now, no matter how big my sphere is, I'm, I'm not going to change the amount of charge I have inside. So this is going to be equal to, so if I solve this for e, I get e out equals 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught q over r squared. Same as for a point charge. Now let's just check. One of the things, what about right at the surface? The two expressions should agree, right? So if I put in big R right here, then I get r over r cubed or is 1 over r squared, and that's 1 over r squared. So I get the same thing, so that's good. Uh, we know that they have the same units, right? Charge over distance squared, charge over distance squared, so that's good too. So there you go. That's how you would find the electric field due to a point charge. Let me give you one quick other example because maybe it'll help you understand. And I'm going to do some more examples uh, later. But let's say I have this. There's a charge. And there's my, my Gaussian surface. And that's a radius of R. And then so I could say uh, E times A equals E times 4 pi r squared equals q n over epsilon naught. So that's my flux. Now imagine this. What if I put like a little negative charge right there? What's going to happen? Well, weird stuff's going to happen, right? Weird stuff's going to happen because now my electric field might look like this. It's really large right there. And then it, this is a dipole, right? So this is going to be, uh, let's see, I'm trying to think of, let's just, Negative would be that way. So I think it would be this way, this way, this way, something like this, like that. And then over here it changed too. So the, the point is I can't use that same idea to calculate the flux around this, right? I can't use that trick and say, oh, electric field's perpendicular to the area, easy peasy. It's not. It's complicated. This is in hat in hat changes direction, and E changes magnitude, it is a non-trivial problem. However, the flux is still Q over epsilon naught. This charge is outside the sphere, so even though it changes the electric field over the whole sphere, the total flux around the same thing is still the same value. And you can't calculate that very easily. What I'd like to do is calculate that uh, numerically for you. Uh, and I'll set that up later. But I just want to point out that there's a lot of cases where the Gauss's law is still true, but not useful. Okay. So I hope that helps. Um, yeah, we'll do some more problems later.